Well, that is a job done. Um, of course, it's starting to get cold here in the UK, so log delivery, it's that time of year, so I can settle into fires in the evening over the next couple of months. But one place that we don't need any additional heat, of course, is the Singapore Grand Prix. Do you like that segue? Uh, right, I'm going to go and have a shower quickly after that, and then we're going to talk about the Singapore Grand Prix, the hottest race on the Formula One calendar. That's better. Um, <laughs> hello, we'll see. Um, right, the Singapore Grand Prix. Now, I'm going to talk about the, the technical side and the technical challenges of the Singapore Grand Prix uh, in a few moments. We're going to go into the, uh, the, the room and um, check it out on the Xbox, have a look around the lap as always. But the other thing about the Singapore Grand Prix that affects not just the drivers uh, but the team as well are the physical challenges of the heat and the humidity. And if you've never been, if you've never been lucky enough to go and visit one of these tropical countries um, like that close to the equator, the heat, the second you step out of your air-conditioned hotel or your air-conditioned vehicle in the morning, the heat, and then even more than that, the humidity just hits you. It just smacks you in the face. What have you got? No, we're not playing. <laughs> no, we're not playing at the moment. <laughs> it just hits you the second you step out of those comfortable aircon conditions. And then you're sweating. Within about 30 seconds of stepping outside of that environment, you're then sweating for the rest of the day, but sweating like you just cannot believe. The humidity, it's like being in a sauna or a steam room just, just all day long. And then on top of that, you're being asked to work, probably for quite long hours, probably pretty intense conditions, high pressure environment. You're being asked to wear at times, certainly during the race, for example, the drivers obviously are wearing full Nomex gear. On race day, the mechanics pit stop crew are also wearing the full fireproof, uh, fireproof kit. <laughs> so you imagine doing all of that in, get out of the way. <laughs> imagine doing all of that in the confines of a sauna and you're somewhere close to a little bit like what it's like uh, in those conditions. So it's a very difficult one to describe, but it's a very difficult one to, to cope with as a team. Of course, your job is exactly the same. You've still got to do exactly the same things, but you're having to do it with so much external pressures and things that could easily distract you and take you off your A game, yet you've still got to be up there performing at the highest level. So I think that's always a really interesting one. Staying hydrated, of course, is is absolutely crucial. The teams will generally turn to the, the team physios, even the driver physios step up and, and really um, play a part with the team as well, encouraging people to drink, giving them electrolytes all day long. Um, people start to fail when they become dehydrated and that can happen incredibly quickly uh, in those conditions. So there's all of that happening. Um, the garages are all really nice, very modern facilities. Um, you know, and actually under the floodlights, it's had a really lovely atmosphere. It's a really very different race. And for that reason, I used to really love it. The city is also incredible. Um, so there's lots of places to go and eat. Uh, the other thing, and, and lovely food, by the way, as well, lots of these kind of street car park type food joints where you've got loads of little stalls selling amazing food um, and really cheap generally as well. So that's where you find the whole paddock uh, is in one of these little car park style eateries in the evenings uh, or in the middle of the morning middle of the night actually of course because there's the time shift and that's the other thing the time shift with it being a night race throws up a whole new set of challenges because you're shifting your whole schedule into the night time but what the teams do given that they're all based in Europe they stay on European time I know lots of you know this but the practicalities of doing that mean that you don't get jet lag because you're staying on the time zone that you're on here in Europe. You still keep to the same schedule that you would on a normal European race. So that actually makes it quite easy in terms of dealing with jet lag. It makes it tricky when it comes to dealing with the external infrastructure around the race, your hotel, um, you know, the shops and restaurants around your hotel that you might need to get supplies from, external suppliers. Um, you know, external services that you might be reliant on for your team to operate over the race weekend. Well, they don't necessarily switch to uh, European time. They're working on local time. So trying to balance all of those things can be tricky. But by now, we've been doing this since 2008. Um, and in that year, in 2008, I remember it being a bit of a mess. Loads of teams doing lots of different things. Um, we tried switching our time frame all uh, gradually through the weekend to end up 
on, on European time, on night race time. Uh, lots of people did it differently. Now we've all conformed where everybody basically stays on Euro time and they've managed to get hotels to accommodate all of that. So the hotels will supply them breakfast at what would normally be lunchtime. The cleaners will, will not come to the floor where the hotel, the Formula One teams are staying, for example, until later in the day when they've gone. So they're not bashing against your door with a hoover. Um, they've got full blackout curtains in the hotel rooms to allow you to sleep in those unconventional times. And places around the hotel and the hotel themselves will provide meals at weird times of day that they wouldn't normally do. So they are now fully geared up to operate on that time zone and it does make it a lot easier for the teams and the drivers uh, to operate over the course of the race weekend. Um, right, shall we go and have a look on the Xbox at the circuit and we'll talk about some of the technical challenges that the teams face at around this place as well. So five kilometre lap, 61 laps around that city street centre circuit. It's bumpy, it's lumpy, it's tight and twisty. The most corners of any circuit on the calendar, 23. Just behind that is Abu Dhabi, incidentally, on 21, I believe. Um, 76 gear changes around a lap. And that means that over the course of a race weekend, there'll be around 13,000 clicks on the paddles on the back of the steering wheel. Imagine that, 13,000 clicks on that tiny little component just in one race weekend. So immediately after that race is done, that steering wheel will be going back to the factory to be uh, assessed, to be taken apart, stripped down, uh, have all the components checked and tested, replaced where necessary. Just imagine the wear that's going on inside that tiny little clicker switch. Anyway, I thought that was quite an interesting detail, 13,000 clicks. Um, it's the softest tyres, of course, for this one. Uh, pretty much the same selection. They were called something different, of course, last year, but the same, roughly the same equivalent tyres. The softest end of the range. Um, tyre wear is actually not that great around here. Um, you know, this is a, a, a massively high downforce circuit because it's all about getting mechanical grip. This is not a power unit dominated circuit like we saw in Spa and Monza. This is one where you need great mechanical grip from the car, and that means that as the car goes round, round uh, corners, how the suspension kinematics work, how the tyres deliver its grip and the chassis deliver its, delivers its grip through the tyres onto the tarmac. So the cars that can do that best are the ones that will really perform well around here. And of course aerodynamics have to play a huge part in that. The speeds are typically much slower than places like the last two circuits we've been to. So the wings become huge. You'll see big maximum uh, aero packages put on the car for this weekend. I guess it's somewhere in between Monaco and Hungary. Aerodynamically is roughly where the Singapore Grand Prix lies in terms of what downforce level you're looking for. Somewhere around that. So pretty high. Um, so that means that the, the drivers and the teams have got a little bit of getting used to because the cars are going to perform in, you know, way, way differently to the way they have done over the last two races. You know, the last two races they've been light, they've been very light on aero, which means the cars have been very light on the circuit, skittish around corners, whereas here they should feel a lot more planted because of all that aero load pushing them down into the tarmac. Uh, in terms of your suspension, because the circuit's so bumpy, you know, it might be that ride heights have to be raised a little bit, suspension, damping, all has to be adapted to take into consideration these massively aggressive lumps and bumps. It's a typical street circuit. So you have the natural lumps and bumps of the road. You've got things like manhole covers that can become treacherously slippy when wet. The white painted lines around any street centre road network, again, can become very slippy if it starts to rain there, which it can do. So there's loads of new challenges to overcome around this place. Um, and very different challenges to the ones that we've all experienced at the last two races. Um, what else have we got? Of course, the, the, the race happens at night, and that means that any sessions, like on a Friday, FP1, typically happens much earlier in the day than anything else over the, the meaningful sessions over race weekend. So FP1 becomes almost redundant. I mean, it's not entirely redundant because you want to get mileage on the cars for certain new components, but in terms of what you can learn about the car around this circuit in representative, uh, representative conditions, it's not going to mean very much. So the circuit doesn't evolve like you get on a normal race weekend with the circuit temperatures peaking in mid-afternoon towards kind of race time um, and then falling away again. You don't get that because the whole thing, or race at least, happens at night. So 
a very different set of circumstances to deal with, as I said, um, but of course teams are very well prepared now for these. I would expect the likes of Mercedes, the likes of Red Bull to come back much stronger in these two races. And the likes of Ferrari with their typical uh, low downforce setup, low downforce, low aero drag concept on their car, just like Renault as well, to be finding places like Singapore a lot harder. And somebody said to me on Twitter the other day, why don't they just bolt some extra bits on, bolt some more downforce on? Of course they will do that, but the aero concept of those cars was centered around a low drag philosophy. So it's not just a case of bolting a big wing on and hoping that works. The Mercedes was centered around a much higher downforce and higher drag philosophy. So it really comes into its own around circuits like this when they can fine tune the concept of their car to suit this circuit. That's what Ferrari had at Monza where they could fine tune their low drag setup for Monza. Here, of course, they're having to take a compromise because this is not the kind of circuit that really suits their car. Anyway, shall we have a little look at a lap? Okay, the final couple of corners are about setting yourself up for one of the few straights on this circuit, the pit straight. It's a DRS zone as well. And then the first complex of corners is about really keeping the speed up fast and flowing through here. The grandstands to the right hand side get an excellent view of the start of the race from up there. I watched it from up there a couple of years ago. Uh, running out wide, look how close the walls are to the exit curves at the exit of that first complex of turns. And then we run down again, running out wide to the curves once more, turning it in. That was a terrible line for me there at that point. Second DRS zone here. This is flat all the way through here, the fastest part of the entire lap. It takes in that corner. It's really just a kink before a big stomp on the brakes, getting it turned in through here. Switching over, there's lots of big directional changes around this circuit, like this. Look at this, running out wide to one corner, getting it over to the far side of the circuit as quickly as you possibly can, and then getting it turned in again, using that inside curve and running out wide. Lots of the corners are blind. You can't see around them. You can't see what's coming. You've got to run it really close to the walls, but trusting that you're going to make it through unscathed. Again, not running out too wide here because we're going to get right back over to the left hand side. Using the lumps and bumps again, look at all the paint painted lines and, and markings, dirt, dust that's all over the road around this place. Across the bridge, here we go, this is flat through here but very narrow and a big stomp on the brakes now. Turning into this left hand side, white painted lines, arrows, markings on the road again, all can become treacherous. Really tight left hander and then for this year, which is new for 2019, a third DRS zone down this short straight. Is it become, going to become an overtaking opportunity? I'm not sure. It's still not a long straight, but at least it will give us something where drivers might be able to try their best to get something done. Fast right-hander for this one then. Running out wide again, look at all the different painted lines and lumps and bumps on the circuit. There's all sorts to contend with around this place. Some of those curbs are really aggressive as well, and you get them wrong and it will launch you up in the air. Don't forget, I'm doing this in daylight. I should have done it at night time, shouldn't I? Underneath the grandstand we go then, through towards the latter part of the lap now. Again, running really wide underneath the motorway bridge. Huge flowing traffic uh, all the way over the weekend at that point. Last couple of corners then, a little dab on the brakes. Touch the curbs, keep the speed up. As I said before, setting yourself up for this DRS straight, start finish straight, all the way down here, and here we go again for another lap. There we go. Um, the other thing about this circuit, as I didn't mention earlier, is that the pit lane is the longest, or the pit lane lost time is the longest of any circuit on the calendar, I believe, which means that you don't want to be making more pit stops than you have to, which really does push people towards a one-stop strategy. But on the other hand, of course, you've got this 100% safety car record around this circuit. There is nowhere to get rid of stricken vehicles should you have an accident or break down, so the chances of a safety car are incredibly high and therefore you need to keep a strategy as flexible as you possibly can to be able to deal with that should it crop up. 
Either way, I think we're in for an interesting weekend. It's not always a race that's full of overtakes, but it is a race weekend that always gives us something, something interesting, and it's a spectacular thing to watch as well. So I think we're in for a treat either way. I can't wait to watch it. Now, I have got a very special prize to give away this week to some lucky viewer. Stand by and I'll go and get it. Right, bear with me because I've got to get them out of this box. They are buried in amongst all of those little quaver-like foam packaging things. Right, I'm not even sure how many are in here, uh, but whoever wins this week is going to win them all. So there's at least one, two, three, four. There might even be more in there, I'm not sure. They're buried. But I want to show you what they are because I have fallen in love with them. Right, check these out. I'll bring the camera closer. <laughs> check these guys out. Little tiny figurines from a company called Print Strike. Uh, of course, all available on the gpbox.com. But I love them, and they got loads more as well. And they, as I say, they made me more in the box. But we've got uh, Ayrton Senna, of course, uh, full size standing up. Well, not full size, but a standing up figure there. Um, Fernando Alonso. Famously in his deck chair, of course. <laughs> Jensen Button uh, holding his crash helmet there. And the faces are all really good. And of course, we've got the Iceman, Kimmy. Uh, and that, if it is your birthday, then perfect. If it's someone else's birthday who knows a Kimmy fan, this is a great little gift to give to somebody, isn't it? So there you go. You will win all four of those. And all I want you to do, because this is a brand new company to me and I love what they're doing, I want you to go to the gpbox.com uh, onto this, the page that is belongs to Print Strike, the people who make these, and I want you to have a look at all the figurines they've got. We've done this before. And then send me a link to the thing on there that you like best. So the one of their products that you like best. Maybe tell me why. And that's it. And then all I need you to do is to share that uh, put it into the comments of this video, so share the, the item that you like best, tell me why, and use the hashtag, G, hashtag GPBSIN, hashtag GPBSIN, and as always, I'll pick the winner out on Monday. So good luck, that's all you got to do, and whoever is the lucky winner on Monday, in Monday's video, will be taking all of these home. Enjoy the Grand Prix folks, let's hope it's a great one, we've had some fantastic races, about six or seven now on the trot, Let's hope this could be another one of those. See you soon. Ta-da!